All right, hello. Thank you all for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series. My name is Jody Rodney, and I am the Vice President of Marketing and Education for Plan Mecca USA. Today is the fourth in our series, and with us today is Dr. Clint Stevens from Oklahoma. Our topic today is Evolve with Digital Dentistry, a Pragmatic Approach to Integrating New Technology. Before we start, I do have a few housekeeping items. Please note that all uh, attendees will be muted by our host. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please submit your issues via the chat function. If you have questions for Dr. Stevens, please submit them via the Q&A function, and we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. We anticipate the presentation portion to take, take approximately 50 minutes, and we are recording the webinar, and it will be available on our registration page. At the end, we will post a CE survey via the chat function, and you must complete the survey to get the CE verification. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Clint Stevens. Thank you, Jody. Audio is okay. It is. Great. Okay, hold on just a second. I love technical difficulties right at the beginning. that builds some anticipation here we go first what i'd like to do is to share with you why i went digital over a decade ago we're pushing two decades now you might not think that this is very relevant for your decision making today at first blush but i'd like to argue that it's actually very relevant to why you'd like to go digital today the reason that i chose to go digital which back in those days meant chairside CAD cam, which was a niche product, was because in my practice, not only in, in dental school, but when I got out, everything that I encountered were clinical situations like this, that I really didn't like the fact that our preference for treating these teeth were full coverage restorations. In school, I trained with some old Air Force guys and gals that considered other alternatives such as cuspal coverage amalgams or other types of things. And I really liked the concept of preserving tooth structure, but cuspal coverage amalgams are pretty ugly. And what I discovered with uh, digital technology as it pertained to the time, which was chairside CAD cam, is that we could actually take teeth like these and instead of doing full coverage crowns, we could provide an aesthetic, long lasting, Restoration was very predictable for the patient, that was satisfactory for the patient from an aesthetic standpoint, and satisfactory for me as a clinician relative to preserving tooth structure and keeping it going. Now, you might say that that really has nothing to do with why you're wanting to go digital today, but what really drove me to go digital had nothing to do with the fact that I wanted or needed to be digital. It had to do with with the fact that the solution that I wanted for my patient was best facilitated through a digital workflow. So for me to be able to take a digital scan and design a restoration and deliver that restoration in a single visit for this type of dentistry was paramount to being able to do the type of dentistry that I wanted to do. It was more efficient, more effective, and it got around a lot of the problematic things with partial coverage dentistry, like what I like to do, um, that one encounters when we're doing it over two visits. So first of all today, what I'd like to argue is that regardless of what type of dentistry you'd like to do today, you can do it better, more efficiently, and have better outcomes for your patient digitally. And it's not that you should digitize for the sake of becoming digital, but rather that whatever solution you want for your patient is best done digitally today. Before we go any further, let me give you a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Clint Stevens. I went to San Antonio for dental school, an AGD at Michigan. You should know that I do have relationships with Ivaclar and Plan Mecca. Um, 
I believe in those companies and, and like working with them because they provide the solutions that I like for my patients. And unfortunately, just like you, I pay for my stuff from those companies just like you do. Um, if you'd like to email me, there's my email. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, even if you like it, don't like it, I'm always happy to get an email. I do practice in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I practice full time as a general practitioner. And of course, Oklahoma these days has a new reputation. Um, I do have a few tigers uh, in the backyard just for fun. Um, not really, but I do have a beautiful wife. She's also a dentist. She works in a DSO environment and is happy to not work in my practice. We don't work in the same practice. And I also have a now 10 year old son uh, who keeps me on my toes at all times. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit about me. Now, what I'd like to talk about is the fact that our perceptions of digital dentistry need an overhaul. So a lot of the things that we associate with digital dentistry are tied to concepts that are already 10, 20, or 30 years old. There are reasons why I switched to go digital, but they're not necessarily relevant to decision-making in 2020. Some of those things that are different are the fact that for a long time, digital solutions, whether we're talking about digital radiography or we're talking about chairside CAD CAM, these types of solutions were just sort of replacement solutions, plug and play solutions that, that didn't really change anything, right? We're just trying to get to the same end uh, using a different pathway to get there. It really didn't change what or why we did something. You sort of changed how we did something. I would argue that today in 2020, everything that we're doing, whether you realize it or not, is digital. And it's not really a replacement solution. Things are evolving to the point where it is becoming the solution. And because of that, it's not only changing how we do things, but it's changing what and why we do things. I'd like to point out three changes that I think are pretty significant. One is that laboratories have gone digital. So when you look at it, the way laboratories make things today versus the way that they make th made things, say, even five or 10 years ago, we've totally shifted. And, and a lot of that has to do, for example, that we've got much better materials today that can facilitate laboratories fabricating monolithic solutions, which historically has been seen as something that's not as aesthetic or not as good as a layered restoration. We've now moved into materials that are extremely aesthetic monolithically and that just with little surface texture and modification can be extremely aesthetic. And it's what laboratories are choosing to do these days because they can get great results with these materials and eliminate a lot of the problems that they have with conventional materials as far as layered ceramics go. So before we used to knock digital dentistry because of monolithic restorations. Now these days, it's what labs are choosing to do over layered restorations. And not only that, uh, they're oftentimes milling those restorations. It's also even what dental students are doing. So at certain universities these days, this is a student case from University of South Carolina, this blows my mind that in one afternoon, a dental student can rock out a case like this. Uh, I would have never dreamed of doing this in school, but a lot of this is facilitated specifically because they leverage digital workflows and mill technologies to get the patient to a very aesthetic result. And if you talk about what we're doing today in the profession, whether dentists realize it or not, the preferences that dentists have towards restorative workflows are all being facilitated by digital workflows in mill restoration. So uh, this graph is a little bit dated in that it's from 2016. And this data is from Gladwell Laboratories showing when they got a digital scan, how things were being made. Now, you notice that a lot of that is already monolithic zirconia. Also, if we talk about custom implant solutions, obviously all of those solutions, whether you're doing a tie base with a restoration over the top or a 
patient-specific custom abutment. Any and all of these solutions are being made by the lab through milling and digital technologies today, not through conventional workflows. And if you watch it, how this changes over time, you'll notice that in 2016, 13% of those restorations are Emacs. If you look at 2018 data from Glidewell, and this is what they fabricate from all impressions, not just digital ones in this case, notice that even in this case, the amount of lithium to silicate restorations or, or related types of restorations is going down. Why? Because they're using more aesthetic zirconia. This shift has nothing to do really with a preference and material choice, but in a workflow choice and that it's easier and cheaper for the laboratory to fabricate things milling and doing it digitally than it is using our conventional workflows. The perhaps gold standard that we've always held for restorations being gold, you'll notice not too many people are doing gold these days, but even if we talk about what historically has always been best made in a conventional model pour and casting, we've even had data today showing that you could fabricate a gold restoration milled that fits better and more predictably than a casting. So even for our most classic example of classic dentistry, you could do it better today if you scanned and milled that case than if you made a physical impression and waxed and cast it. Another change that's being facilitated by digital dentistry is, is specifically how we're doing things. As I mentioned, when we talk about implant workflows, the old days of snappy cap abutments with either stock abutments or with UCLA type abutments, which is very much a conventional laboratory workflow type of flow, is been totally replaced, regardless of how you'd like to do it, with the digital workflow. So, for example, this case where we have a broken mesial marginal ridge on an old PFM crown that was on a, a stock abutment. This is a very classic 1990s, early 2000s implant dentistry. Patient comes in, they fractured the mesial marginal ridge. This happens, right? Why? Because we have a lot of unsupported ceramic there. So now when we go to replace this restoration these days, I don't think hardly any of us would choose a stock abutment or a UCLA type of abutment in this scenario. What we did for this patient is replace it with a uh, titanium base supported uh, monolithic zirconia abutment and an all ceramic crown over the top. Uh, this was the best way for us to fill in that space mesial distally. As you can see, it was a pretty large space and that, that titanium blank uh, was not as big as a zirconia. Blank. That's why we chose zirconia. But this case was started on a Monday. The patient came into the office with the fractured marginal ridge. We made a new impression. And by Thursday, we had the case completed. And the only reason it took that long is because the lab sent the abutment back with two days shipping. So this is the way that digital is changing what used to be a multiple week fabrication process that was very labor intensive and now we're managing it digitally in a much more efficient and effective way that's totally changing how we're making things. Or, for example, if we look at another implant case in which in my office historically this has been a, uh, well, if we ignore the diagnostic visit, we're talking about a, a three visit uh, event. One, the patient receiving the, the implant, the second visit, to make our final impression in the third visit to deliver the restoration. I'm not the fastest operator in town, so normally this would have taken me say, let's say an hour the first visit, uh, and let's say 30 minutes the second and third visit. So I'm looking at three chair visits and about two hours of clinic time for me to finish this case in, in a conventional manner. This particular case, we actually were able to deliver not only uh, the lower implant, but also to, to treat the upper arch as well. We did it in two visits, and I probably spent a total chair time of about 75 minutes. And the way that we did that was leveraging digital technology to plan where the implant went up ahead of time, went ahead and made our 
final impression the day that we placed the implants. In the subsequent visit, the patient came back and we were able to deliver the final custom abutments and crown on the subsequent visit. This totally changes how we manage patients and how we're able to better affect our our ability to, to give efficient and predictable outcomes to our patients. And, and it's all because of being able to leverage digital workflows. And that really speaks to the fact that digital is redefining what is possible in our offices. So these days I have a lot of um, problems that I didn't used to have, right? A, a patient in this scenario, let's say a 12 year old female, 13 year old female, 14, that comes out of braces with congenitally missing laterals. Uh, this used to be an easy Holly appliance with a couple of teeth on it and see you in, in five or 10 years. Well, if, at least in my practice, and of course, um, I'm in Oklahoma, it's not the, the highest demanding area for, for aesthetics and these sorts of things, but my patients now, demand things that are fixed in the mouth, that are, are aesthetic. And the big obstacle for me with these types of cases, historically, if we're going to say use a resin bonded fixed partial denture, some type of uh, quote unquote Maryland bridge, is that I'm not doing the orthodontics. So first the, the brackets have to come out of the way, then, then I have to get final impressions and then those restorations have to be fabricated so historically, if a patient wanted a fixed outcome here, they would be about two weeks before, uh, from the time they came out of orthodontics until I was able to fix them. Patients didn't really like that, that time without teeth, and, and it, was, it was a bit of a hassle. Thanks to digital workflows now, this same case in my office that used to take a couple of weeks, now is completed before the patient ever comes out of braces. So once the patient is set up and ready to go, we can go ahead and take the brackets off digitally. We can bring them into CAD software and design the final restorations. And the same day that the patient gets their braces off, they come to my office and we deliver the resin-bonded cantilevered fixed partial dentures the patient's about an hour without teeth just because they've got to drive to see me and we've got to bond them in. But we've gone from, from two weeks and, and a lot of time without teeth to making this very streamlined for the patient. Uh, patient satisfaction's through the roof. And to be quite honest, it's much more efficient and effective for, for me as well. Another thing that is redefining what's possible with, with digital is the fact that we're now doing a lot of digital smile design. And this is a, another student case from the University of South Carolina. In this case, this patient wanted to increase in size, ledge length with some veneers. This case was, was designed digitally first. And not only was it designed, but then the patient got to see a preview of what was coming. Then the ceramics were, preparations were done, ceramics were delivered, gorgeous ceramics. But as we as providers know, the biggest challenge in aesthetic cases is communicating with the patient relative to expectations for the final outcome. And the amazing thing now today is through digital technologies, we're actually able to deliver exactly what we promised to the patient and know that we're gonna end up at a predictable income point where everybody's happy. We've never been able to do this before and it's thanks to digital technology that we're now able to make these types of cases predictable in ways that we couldn't before. Or let's take a case like Jenna's. So Jenna went to Jamaica with her husband uh, they were having a great time. They went to the pool. Uh, the slide looked fun. And of course now, um, as they're coming down the slide together, because that's what you do on a romantic getaway, somehow Jenna ate the back of her husband's head. Now, Jenna had some pre-existing things going on with multiple treatments with ortho and orthognathic treatment that that predisposed her to having some significant issues when she 
hit the back of his head. But if you'll see, basically the only thing that was keeping her teeth in her head um, after they came down that side was the fact that she had a bonded orthodontic wire there. Now, traditionally in my workflows, this case would have likely started with extractions of teeth and then we just make a flipper and then we see where we end up. We chose a different route for this case because at the end of the day, the most important thing that I need to know is for the final treatment plan, where are we going to end up? Where do we want teeth in Jenna's face? So the first thing that we did with Jenna uh, was not extractions or a block graft or anything like that, but we actually did some orthodontics. So if you'll notice when Jenna came to see me, when you, when you look at that, uh, picture in the upper right hand corner that's Jenna in full occlusion she couldn't get her teeth together because her front teeth were hitting and she couldn't get her back teeth together we did a, a few uh, pulpectomies with calcium hydroxide and some of those uh, maxillary anterior teeth scanned her in and with a few aligners we were able to get Jenna's teeth back together in the posterior we were able to then get her teeth realigned. And from there, we asked Jenna, okay, Jenna, is this where you want to be? Are you happy with the, the position of your teeth where they are on your face now? Jenna said, yes. Hey, this is great. Now we've got a place to start from. So from here, we were able to capture that data digitally. And now as we go through our treatment planning uh, and execution of that treatment plan, we can maintain teeth where we want them. So Jenna went through extractions in a block graft, and then subsequently we placed some implants. You can see she's got a lot of hardware from previous surgeries. The overlay that you see of these teeth are actually where her original teeth were before they came out. So we're able to transfer that data digitally into our surgical execution because we know not only at the end are we going to have a, a white problem, we gotta, we got to stick the teeth somewhere, but we're going to have a pink problem. You can appreciate with the amount of recession that she's got in several places and where her lip line is in that picture, and hey, we're likely going to have not only the need to put back some teeth, but we're going to have a soft tissue deficiency from an aesthetic point of view. So we're already planning when we're placing our implants to be sure that we're going to be able to deliver a prosthesis that could be screw retained and involve putting back the gingival architecture. Okay, so once we got the implants in place, great. Now Jenna's been wearing a snap-on smile as a provisional as things are healing. And now you can see once Jenna's fully healed, yeah, we have a we have a soft tissue deficiency, right? So we already anticipated this, but now that we've got a, a snap on smile in place, we can go back and ask Jenna, okay, Jenna, how do you like this now? And Jenna says, you know what? I've been pretty happy with this, but I think the teeth are too long. So the nice thing is we can digitally transfer this data back into CAD software, shorten those incisal ledges to put them where Jenna would like them. And then we can go to our final restorative solution and know that we're going to end up where Jenna wanted us to be. In this case, I chose to do a, a cobalt chrome framework that we covered with ceramic, and then we redigitized that framework and designed individual unit crowns that I milled in my office and delivered our, our final outcome. All of this workflow from start to finish was done digitally, except obviously that once we fabricated the cobalt chrome framework and, and put ceramic on it, we had to uh, have a printed model to redigitize that so that we could finish the case. But this gives me maximum retrievability, met all of Jenna's aesthetic uh, desires, and we knew we were going to end up there because she got to see it before we ever finalized. And this, of course, is the, the new aesthetic gold standard, the selfie. Uh, Jenna was more than happy to share as many selfies as I wanted of her new smile, and she was extremely pleased which at the end of the day, to have full control over my patient outcome and know that we're gonna end up there predictably, especially in these challenging complex aesthetic cases, has always been a challenge. And I've never been better equipped to deal with these than with digital workflows today. 
because the honest truth is, is that we're no longer in a situation in which digital is replacing conventional workflows or non-digital workflows. It's really that digital workflows are making them obsolete. So for example, when we talked about integral sensors for a moment at the beginning, replacing film, advanced 2D and 3D imaging today is really redefining what a diagnostic image is. So whether if we just compare a, a standard PA or a standard bite wing to what we're able to get these days with um, an extra roll bite wing, for example, that can already show an incipient lesion better than a standard bite wing and or give a clinician much more data in one x-ray than you could ever have with one or the other. This is really redefining what a diagnostic image should be when we're trying to help patients identify and make decisions about how to solve problems. Or what I see every day in my practice now is that I have somebody like Bill come in. Uh, we can talk about the open margin on 13 later, but Bill came in because he had fractured porcelain on 14. He was asymptomatic, not having any problems, and he just wanted his crown replaced. The two APA, uh, the two DPA, you know, you look at that, and and it looks like maybe the PDL on that mesial root's intact. Uh, looks a, maybe a little weird, but of course we're we're taking a two D image here. We've got the sinus involved, and Bill is asymptomatic, so Bill just wants me to replace the crown. But I said, Bill, hey, before we replace that crown. Let's just take a look, right? So when we look at Bill in 3D now, we can see that Bill has a huge lesion on the mesial buccal root that was not definable or diagnosable in 2D, but was very apparent in 3D. Bill didn't even have to have me tell him anything. As soon as Bill saw this image, Bill said, oh, I need a root canal. Yeah, you do, Bill. So this totally changed what my treatment plan would have been uh, I'm a pretty conservative guy. If I've got an asymptomatic tooth and everything looks sort of okay in 2D and we've got a broken crown, most likely in my practice, I'm just going to replace that crown. This totally changes my ability to diagnose and appropriately treat my patients by having better information to help them. Another example of this that recently was in my practice is Niles' case where uh, he came in and just said, you know what, Doc? It feels sort of funny up here by my by my lip. And his original bridge was done in 1965 after a nice skating accident. It was redone in the mid 2000s. I know about the redo because it was done by my predecessor in my practice. And so this existing root canal post corp. Um, fixed partial denture. It's been in the mouth about 15 years. Uh, there's no mobility on the bridge. Everything looks good. And, and I'm looking at this in 2D and you can probably appreciate that maybe there's a, a lesion around the root there, though in this area we know 2D radiography is sometimes has artifacts that's created by, by anatomical structures there. But I said, okay, now so let's Let's take a let's take a look in 3D. Of course, I'm hoping this bridge stays intact because I think you can appreciate it. it looks like there's a, a pretty large defect in the bone uh, next to number eight, where number nine used to be back in the 60s. And I'm really hoping that we could just do an apicoectomy here to resolve this problem and get this down the road a little bit. Well, turns out that we have a much bigger problem than. I wanted us to have, and then I think you can appreciate that the the strut of the bone loss there is right where that post ends, and we have a pretty apparent root fracture with with not a whole lot of buccal plate left to work with, and this is a big hot mess. The interesting thing though is is that at the same time, uh, what we didn't discover is that we actually have a lot of bone to place an implant in. That huge bony defect was actually just his incisive canal there that was uh, pretty darn big. But now we discovered that, that while number eight isn't savable, number nine still is a very viable uh, spot for us to place a dental implant. And so we chose to go with an implant number nine, graft number eight, and see about maybe doing 
uh, cantilevered fixed partial ventricle on this, which I'd give you a post-op shot in the mouth, but he travels a lot and no sooner than we got this x-ray, he was out the door and off he goes. But thanks to digital technology, not only did it change my decisions relative to what might be appropriate treatment here, but it helped me avoid complications and problems. It totally changed how I treated these patients. And these types of scenarios in my practice happen on a weekly basis. When we talk about scanning, the scanners, really the first scanners, weren't even that great of replacements for triple trays. Today's scanners, I would tell you, are gonna totally change how we collect data and monitor patients longitudinally over time in our practices. So, first of all, there's still some misconceptions about how good digital scans are. Let's look at this old data. This is from 2016, which is forever ago because these are systematic reviews and meta-analyses that are done with data that's, that's well over half a decade old for them to have been published in 2016. And we already know from that data that what most of us, at least general practitioners, do on a daily basis, which is single tooth dentistry, doing a crown on a posterior tooth, we've already known for a long time that digitally generated crowns, whether they're, regardless of their manufacturing, that if the data is acquired digitally, they're as good or better as ones made with conventional impressions relative to marginal fit and clinical outcome. Uh, and we also know that it's not just quadrants anymore. So if you start to look at data on uh, implant supported fixed hybrids, or you start to look at orthodontics, we have a lot of data now showing that digital scanning is meeting or exceeding conventional outcomes when we start to talk about these things. In fact, if you look at the systematic review, uh, for example, with orthodontics, they state that digital models could be considered the new gold standard in current practice. This is not just a, okay, it's as good. This is a, hey, this is the new gold standard. So it's not really for quadrants anymore. And if you look at how things are developing rapidly now over time, we're getting to the point where our, our last holdups relative to uh, full arch impression making, which was really where digital scanners had been most challenged to meet conventional impressions, we're now reaching the point where you have multiple scanners on the market that have no significant differences in making impressions when we're making full arch impressions. So, the, for example, you can look, this is some data from the uh, University of South Carolina's group who have published a lot on this topic. Um, there are a ton of scanners out there today, and we look at, at full arch trueness and dentate models, and we're reaching the same numbers now with the dentalist models. Uh, we are absolutely reaching the point where conventional impressions are being surpassed by digital impressions. If you want to know on this graph where PBS impressions would land, then this is about where PBS comes out in their data. So all of those other scanners are showing more trueness cross arch than a conventional PBS impression. Now, you also have to ask yourself, when's the last time that we had a significant improvement in impression making outcomes with PBS? The answer to that is probably about 20 years ago. Uh, now, with digital scanners, you can even see on this chart uh, the same hardware with different software or changes in hardware can overnight uh, make the, the accuracy or the trueness of a scanner twice as good overnight, and it's constantly evolving. So while we're stalled out, we're never going to get any better with physical impressions than we are right now. However, our digital impressions are constantly evolving and changing and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future to where we're really going to leave physical impression making behind. So before when we talked about digital dentistry and, and we're, we're talking about CAD-CAM 
Cheerside CAD CAM and that was it. And we talk about same visit treatment. Oh, that's great. But now I would argue that integrated comprehensive dentistry can be done better digitally than ever before. So whether we're talking about interdisciplinary diagnosis and treatment planning, whether you're working with a surgeon or an orthodontist, whether we're looking at airway, we're looking at TMJ, we're looking at integrating a smile design, any of these sorts of things, not only in the treatment planning phase can be done better digitally and integrate data that you can't integrate in a non-digital landscape, but also when you go to execute that treatment, whatever that solution might be, you're gonna have more predictable results and more control over your outcomes being digital than ever before. And digital is now making same visit treatment, not just about fixing a tooth with a crown or partial coverage restoration. The other day we printed a surgical guide in 38 minutes. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, things that used to be multiple visit appointments are going to start to be pushed into single visit appointments thanks to digital workflows. And contrary to the popular belief uh, or beliefs that we have in dentistry, if going digital doesn't mean any of these things. It doesn't mean that you need to become a radiologist. You can take a 3D image and get a board certified radiologist to read that scan for 70 bucks. You don't need to do anything there that you don't want to do. Uh, there's a perception that if you get a mill, you have to become a lab technician. Uh, that's not true. It, there's a lot of differences in modern materials management today that make a lot of the things that even what laboratory technicians do different than it used to be. It's much easier, more predictable to deliver restoration chair side today than ever before. But if you don't want to go there, the perception that you have to change your office workflows or change what materials you use or change what preparation styles you like to go digital is not true anymore. It was true 15 years ago, but it's not true anymore because we've reached the point where you can acquire that data digitally and facilitate whatever solution you prefer digitally and do it better than if you made a, a conventional impression. Imaging and scanning really have reached the point where these are disruptive technologies that can absolutely plug you into modern treatment planning and modern solution fabrication without disrupting what you do in your practice today at all. And when we talk about printing and milling, it's true that these things have a larger learning curve uh, with respect to implementation, but they're getting more plug and play every day in which the amount of effort that it took to learn to integrating in office printing or milling five or 10 years ago, uh, the amount of effort is significantly less to do that today. And it's getting better all the time. I'm in a private practice. I would expect that maybe many of you are, and sometimes it's problematic figuring out how we're gonna integrate this type of technology into uh, a business, right? So I'd like to provide a little perspective on that. First of all, I would tell you that it's not just about the numbers. So the nice thing for you, unlike when I was integrating digital technologies in my practice, is that you can go to a manufacturer or a distributor and they all have return on investment calculators and they can take numbers from your practice and plug them in and show you exactly what the effect is economically on your practice. And, and that's nice and that's a good thing to do, but, but I would hesitate uh, for a moment and caution you that I think these calculators uh, woefully underestimate the impact of going digital on your business from several respects. One, patients don't like non-digital dentistry. They all prefer the digital experience. And this isn't a, a hard concept, I think, to grasp, but, uh, you know, I would also argue that patients don't like to come to see us. I have patients that are great friends. 
I know all about their kids. They know about mine. We have, we have a great uh, rapport and they've been coming to see me for a long time, but we've all had it where we've seen a patient for uh, a decade. They've come in and seen us a lot of times and then they need a tooth fixed and they come in and you're trying to get a lower block and they were flustered getting to the office and you don't get the block the first time. And then they're still sort of not numb. And then you have to add more. And we have a, uh, an adverse experience, right? And all of a sudden this patient is just moved their job. It's not convenient to come to you anymore. And even though they've seen you two dozen times and have great experiences and know your kid's name and everything, Hey, now all of a sudden, because of that negative experience, they're thinking about maybe switching to dentists because it's one that's closer to the, where they're working now and it's more convenient. And that, that uh, less than ideal experience uh, sort of sets them off. For me as a business owner and somebody that's trying to keep patients in my practice, those types of complications or adverse events are are really a negative thing in my business. I would argue that by leveraging digital technologies and being able to oftentimes eliminate second visits or eliminate other visits with patients, you're cutting the number of times in half that you can screw it up. In other words, you can not have to have that second visit. And, and really, even with our best intentions, anytime we're having to numb a patient up or bring them back for a subsequent visit, there's always a chance that we could have something go not quite right that then sours the mood and has that patient looking elsewhere. elsewhere. Um, so I think it's a very powerful thing to be able to condense visits and is the only practitioner in my practice uh, it also helps me maximize how much chair time I've got to do other productive things. Uh, and the other thing is, is that with my patients today, my older patients, hey, they just think the technology's cool and they've done it the old school way and they like the new school way, right? It's, it's cool. But my younger patients expect the technology. My younger patients have everything at the touch of, and, and even now some of my older patients, because of the way our world is shifting, hey, they're expecting everything to be right now. And they don't understand why it takes another visit or why it takes so long. They have expectations set and the expectation is much more aligned with the digital reality than it is with the non-digital one. If we do talk about CBCT or, or Cheerside CAD CAM, then because we're eliminating visits and because we're streamlining uh, workflows, we're able to eliminate not only material and operational costs, uh, but really for me, the most powerful thing is that we can uh, actually save the production time that was gonna be scheduled for a follow-up visit with that patient and and keep that open on the books for later. The only appointment I can't fill on my books at five o'clock is an opening that I had at three o'clock earlier in the day, right? So otherwise, anything on future days for future production, that's an opportunity there for me to be able to see another patient that thanks to these workflows uh, gives me more available production time. And when we start talking with especially office managers and these sorts of things, and the fact that we're able to definitively provide treatment allows us to collect that money that time, that day, regardless of what the insurance set up or if, it, if there's insurance or not or how they pay, it doesn't matter. We're done. We collect. So cash flow, really, when you start implementing these types of technologies, is much better and more efficient than with non-digital approaches. And really for me, the best thing about digital technologies, regardless of where you want to plug and play today, and regardless of what kind of solutions you want to provide your patients, which really is what drives us to search out better workflows and better ways of doing things because we're vested in our patient outcomes. Going digital means you get better data, which means you have more control which leads to fewer complications, which in my practice, the biggest thing that kills time and production is dealing with complications. And the fewer the 
times that I can have complications, the more efficient and productive my practice is. So uh, at the end here, what I'd like to do is give you some advice, some consumer advice from a fellow consumer, right? Because I've had to make all these purchases just like you might have to. Number one, when you hear talk about digital day, you, you'll hear a lot of talk about open act architecture. Open architecture refers to um, hardware and software platforms that are, are interactive that allow you to export data out, bring data in, and interact with other systems that might be from a different manufacturer. Uh, and, and you need to be careful because oftentimes manufacturers will say that they have open architecture, but it's not always true. Right, so you need to be very careful about knowing whether they're open in the ways that you need them to be. Uh, and the nice thing about open architecture is that this um, safeguards you against investing in something that won't plug and play with other technology that you wanna buy a few years down the line. Um, so when you're looking at new technologies, I'd, I'd encourage you to pay careful attention to several things. Um, because this is uh, becoming more complicated every day to figure out what to buy and what not. One, obviously you look at the sticker price, you look at the cost up front, and be sure that when you're being sold a product or you're looking at a product, that you're not paying for things that aren't relevant to your practice or that are gimmicky but don't really do anything for your practice. Right? Then next, the biggest hurdle really isn't the purchase, but the biggest hurdle is you integrating this technology into your practice, which is, is far and away harder than the purchase itself. And you need to know who's got your back when you're buying this technology and how it integrates with your practice and what kind of support you'll have over time with that technology. You should be aware of architecture. You, should need, you need to know what a manufacturer offers you now and you need to know how it's going to help you later if you decide to go with a different manufacturer later down the road. Is it going to plug and play? Can you keep doing what you want to do? And then you need to be very cognizant of the fact that not only do you have a sticker price up front, but there's a cost of ownership over time, regardless of whose technology you buy. And just like when you're buying cars or anything else, you need to be aware of those costs over time because the cost up front versus looking at uh, five-year ownership costs can be very different. And you need to be sure that you get good numbers to know where you're going to end up on that. Um, as a final note, I would tell you that if you don't go digital now, it's going to cost you more. We all know that it's going to cost money to reinvest in digital technologies over time. And we deal with this with our cell phones and with everything else in our life. And it's annoying and it's a pain in the neck. But not investing in digital technologies at this point is going to put you behind for several reasons. One, we already know that there are digital workflows for almost everything you do that are more efficient and cost effective than what you're doing now. Two, all of our specialties and all of what we're doing relative to interdisciplinary comprehensive dentistry is moving into a digital space. And you can't afford not to be able to communicate with your specialists and laboratories and colleagues to be able to get the best outcomes for your patients. And finally, at least in my environment, patient perceptions are changing and you need to be sure that you're staying upfront and relative to your patients over time so that you're not um, losing market share in an, in an increasingly commoditized market. It's getting more and more competitive. Your patients are expecting you to be digital and being there is gonna be very important. So that's all I've got uh, to share with you. I'd love to open it up to question and answers and, and see what we got. All right, before we um, dig into the Q&A, um, okay. I just wanted to comment that we will be posting the CE survey link um, in the chat function and the AGD code uh, for CE verification is 250. All right, so now we will dig into questions. Um, 
When talking about integrating technology into your practice, what time do you estimate for intraoral scanners learning curve? And do you um, have advice for having the dental assistant or the dentist doing a scan? So it's getting easier to integrate scanners all the time relative to how long it takes to get going. Uh, I love uh, an assistant delegated workflow, right? That's, that's the most efficient and productive way to work though. I personally still like if I'm doing a scan, say for restoration, I still like to scan the preparation because I get a lot of uh, feedback from that scan, right? I, I can see things much better. And there's a lot of things that you can catch when you, you get that kind of uh, feedback data wise that can allow you to improve your, your preparation and improve that outcome there. So, um, but overall, I would say that, that we're getting to where integration is pretty quick and easy. The, I think the key point is just like with anything else, when you're ready to integrate that scanner, you need to get rid of the impression trays and the impression material and be vigilant and consistent with staff about the fact that this is how we're doing things now. Because like anything else, when you're first learning something, hey, you're going to have some frustrating experiences. And the knee-jerk reaction is to go back with what you're comfortable with. So uh, really, the, the best piece of advice I have for, for practices that want to do that is that you have to eliminate that as an option, not let them use their current workflows um, or you know, physical impressions as a crutch, and force them to go digital. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised about how quickly that transition can happen. Oh, sorry, uh, I was on mute. Is it difficult to keep the software and hardware always up to date? Um, well, you know, the, the challenging thing with technology, whether it's your iPhone or your scanner or whatever, is that, uh, you, you know, things are always changing. Then, At least my experience recently over the last few years has been that most of those upgrades and changes have a very positive effect on uh, how good my arm and materium works. And, you know, today we already know that our, our hardware and software works extremely well to do what we want to do. So even if you were stuck with today's technology, you'd be in pretty good shape. Um, and some of that also too is manufacturer specific. So when you're looking at different systems, you need to be aware of how they manage software updates. And you also need to at least take a look at historically how they've managed hardware updates because eventually everybody's upgrading their hardware. And, and uh, I don't think those challenges are any different than you have with your cell phone or your TV, but sometimes the nitty gritty details of those types of changes can be different depending on which manufacturer it is. All right, the next one is specific to Jenna's case. Um, what did you find pre-op um, from imaging and clinical that led you to decide on extraction instead of completion of RCTs plus tissue grafting? Oh, yeah, so uh, I didn't show you all of uh, Jenna's case. Uh, otherwise, it would have been uh, a lot more clear. So those, uh, the roots on those teeth were extremely shortened from several rounds of previous orthodontics. Uh, she had no buckle plate at all. Those teeth were basically sitting uh, outside of the bony housing almost completely. Um, and so there was, there was really no, no viable way to maintain those teeth. Even had the roots been foreshortened, had we had teeth inside bony housing, oh, I'm with you. I would have uh, loved to consider uh, just finishing with the uh, root canal therapy and augmenting the soft tissue to, to keep things. All right, do you charge your patients for same day delivery or treatment? No. I'm guessing differently than you would no, normally. No, if, it, if anything, uh, for me, it's more efficient and productive for me to do it the same day than for me to have a follow-up visit. So I, I don't, uh, I'd, I'd almost rather charge them more if they had to come back. But 
I, I don't, you know, but no, I, every, everything is the same uh, cost for me. It's better for me if I do it in one visit. All right. The next one is specific to a case that you shared. What did you cement your Maryland bridge lateral replacement with? Uh, well, that was resin bonded there. So we, we totally etched the enamel and, and, you know, used a universal adhesive and then used a dual cure resin cement. All right. And the last question, thoughts of, um, the scanners on the market, um, which one do you like the best? Well, this is, yeah, this is a tough uh, decision to make these days because unlike before, man, you've got a lot of great options out there uh, today. So I'm currently using the Planmac Emerald S. I like that scanner uh, for several reasons. One, uh, as you saw, there's, there's plenty of scanners that are very accurate these days. That's definitely one of them. Uh, the open architecture allows me to plug and play with whatever I want. And um, the cost of ownership for that, that scanner is, is, is great over time compared to competitors uh, that don't control what I do with my data. And if I wanted to add in some other manufacturer at some other point, um, regardless of what it is, uh, it, I wouldn't be stopped at all. So from a consumer standpoint, I think it's a great, uh, great buy because it's not, it's not painting me in a corner. Great. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all of the questions um, and thank you for your time, Dr. Stevens. Uh, hopefully if you wanted to shoot him an email, uh, you saw his email uh, at the beginning of his presentation. Again, the presentation has been recorded um, and it will be available within a few hours um, on our registration page. Thank you much for your time and have a great day. Great, thank you. Thank you.